Many of you know that I am a huge sci-fi fan. <laughs> really? I never knew that. I love sci-fi movies. I love space stories, time travel stories, superhero stories. I love Star Wars and Star Trek. A few years ago, I actually preached a Star Wars message. How many remember? Uh, the message was entitled, May the Fourth Be With You. I <clears throat> uh, love Star Wars, love Star Trek. One of my favorite television shows of all time was Star Trek The Next Generation. How many remember that show? Well, the title of tonight's message is Faith Life, The Next Generation. I want to focus tonight on the importance of reaching the next generation for Christ. And I want everybody to hear me tonight because this is very important. The body of Christ has an absolutely vital responsibility of passing on our Christian values and our knowledge and our wisdom to the generation coming up behind us. Folks, if we fail to do this, Christianity fizzles out. I think it was Ronald Reagan that said, we are never more than one generation away from losing our freedom. Well, I'll tweak that and I'll just say, we're never more than one generation away from losing our Christian values. Because if we don't pass it on to the next generation, it dies out. Now, I don't believe that God is ever going to allow the flame to die out completely. Because throughout the history of the body of Christ, there has always been a remnant that has carried the torch. Uh, even in the history of Israel, when Israel was backsliding and when Israel was getting into idolatry and all sorts of uh, ungodly things. There was always a remnant in Israel that stayed true to God and that, and that carried on the truth. Even throughout the dark ages, there was always a remnant that did not allow the light of God's truth to burn out. God loves the world too much to let the light fizzle out completely. Amen? Amen. But what I want to say tonight is this, may it never be said of us that we failed to pass the torch on to the next generation. But here's the thing, let's face it, the older generation has always had difficulty connecting with the younger generation. It's always been that way. You know, people these days, they want to talk about how millennials are entitled and how uh, Gen Z doesn't have a clue about how the world works. But guess what? They said the same thing about my generation. They said the same thing about Generation X. They said the same thing about baby boomers. They said the same thing about young folks in the 30s and 40s. It hasn't changed. Every generation finds it difficult to respect the generation that's coming up after them. And part of this disrespect comes from the fact that we don't want to own up to the truth that we raised the next generation. In other words, if there's something wrong with the younger generation, let's not forget that we were the ones who raised them. So don't take your frustration out on them. Be mature enough to shoulder some of the blame yourself. Amen? People model the behavior that was modeled to them. So if the next generation is a mess, we might want to take a look in the mirror. The body of Christ has got to do a better job at ministering to the next generation. We've got to learn how to connect to the next generation. We've got to find common ground with them so that we can speak into their lives. Can you say amen to that? We must find a way to reproduce ourselves in the next generation. Otherwise, the legacy that we carry will die with us. So I want to show you some things in the Bible tonight about the next generation. Uh, the first story that I'm going to uh, share with you tonight, it comes from the story of Israel sending the 12 spies into the promised land. How many remember that story? So Israel was in Egyptian slavery for about 400 years. Moses leads them out of Egypt across the wilderness 
to the promised land. And it only took a few weeks for them to get from Egypt to the promised land. You know, when I was a kid growing up, I always thought that it took Israel 40 years to get to the promised land. No, what happened was it took them a few weeks to get there. And then God said, I want to send 12 spies. He said this to Moses. I want you to take one person from each of the 12 tribes. I want you to send them into the land to spy out the land. Now, why was he doing this? They needed to come up with a game plan about how they were going to retake the land. So I want you to send 12 spies into the, into the land, let them spy out the land, let them take notes of the topography and where are the mountains and where are the forests and where are the bodies of water and where are the cities and who's living in those cities so that we can come up with a game plan on how to retake the land. And they sent those 12 spies into the land and God said, this is the land I have given you. So this has already been established. The land is yours. And they sent those 12 spies into the, into the land. And 10 of those spies came back and they said, we can't do this. We, we can't take this land. The, the land swallows up the people that live there. Well, if that's true, then how do they live there? Right? They said, we're grasshoppers in their sight. Well, how do you know that you're grasshoppers in their sight? If you're a spy, they shouldn't have seen you. You shouldn't have had any contact with them. So how do you know what they think about you? And they came up with all of these excuses as to why they couldn't take the land. And those 10 spies, 10 of the 12, only Joshua and Caleb came back with a positive report. They said, man, we're more than able to go do this. But they didn't listen to Joshua and Caleb, they listened to the other 10, and fear gripped the entire nation of Israel, and they didn't go into the land. And so they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. See, when I was a kid, I thought it was a 40 year journey to get there. No, it wasn't, it was just a few weeks. But they wandered in the wilderness. Why? Because the people had lost faith. The people were gripped with fear. The people were grumbling and complaining. So here's what God did. Numbers chapter 14, we're gonna start in verse 26. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? Man, may it never be said of us that we're a wicked community. How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. Now here's what popped off the page to me the other day. Did you notice that the only people, other than Joshua and Caleb, the only people who were allowed to enter the promised land were teenagers and children. If you were 20 years old or older, you weren't gonna go in. The only people who were allowed to go in were teenagers and children. The teenagers and children had not lost their faith. The teenagers and children were not gripped by fear. The teenagers and children were not grumbling and complaining. It was the old folks that were doing that. Folks, there's one thing that's certain about young people. Young people are less afraid of new things than old people are. Young people are less intimidated by the unknown. Young people are typically more open-minded than older people are. And young people typically have not allowed the circumstances of life to rob them of their faith. Young people have energy. Young people have zeal. Young people approach life with bright-eyed optimism. Now older people will look at that optimism and they call it naive. But look, faith 
is always optimistic. Faith always has a positive outlook. Faith believes in a positive God and a positive outcome. Young people are more open to what God wants to do in their life. Statistics have proven we are much more likely to come to the Lord at an early age than after we come into adulthood. Look at this statistic. 85% of Christians gave their life to Christ by the age of 14. 85%. That's six out of seven. I was born again at the age of 10. So I'm part of that 85%. How many of you, by show of hands, how many of you are part of that 85%? You gave your heart to the Lord before you were 14 years old. Amen. So don't tell me that it's not important to reach young people. Because after they become older, they're much less likely to accept the gospel. Young people have a tenacious faith. And that's why we see over and over and over again, God's word is telling us that we need to approach him with the faith of a child. How many times does he say that? Mark chapter 10, let me show you something really powerful. Verse 13, it says, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. The disciples were trying to turn kids away from Jesus. Now, I got to thinking about that. Why would they do that? Why would you want to turn anybody away from Jesus? And the thought occurred to me, the disciples probably thought, as a lot of people do, that a minister doesn't want to bother with ministering to children. Because after all, they're just kids. What can they possibly understand about faith? What can they possibly understand about God's word? They're just kids. They don't take anything serious. You know, I once worked for a pastor, this was about 30 years ago, when I was living in Indiana. I worked for a pastor who, um, we would go to these pastor's luncheons. And one thing about pastors, whenever they talk to each other about pastoring, they always ask the same question. How many people are you running? It's, it seems to be a gauge, you know? We, we, we want to gauge each other's success by how many people are attending our church. Which is kind of funny because Jesus only had 12. And they changed the world. Amen. Amen. But pastors always ask each other that same question. How many are you running? Which I always thought it was funny because, it, well, it doesn't matter how many I'm running. It matters how many I'm keeping. I can run plenty of people off. But uh, we were at one of these luncheons one day, and one of the other pastors asked my pastor, he said, uh, how many are you running? And my pastor said, oh, we're running about 120, 125 people. And then he give, the guy says, does that include children? And my pastor got mad. He goes, of course it includes children. What, you, you think children are any less legitimate than adults? Children are people. Of course I'm counting children. So these people were trying to bring children to Jesus and the disciples were trying to turn them away. Well, let's see what Jesus said about that. Next verse. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. I like that word. He, he was angry. He was mad. He was disappointed. He was displeased. He was indignant. He said to his disciples, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. The what belongs to children? Kingdom. The kingdom. Now, is he talking about heaven? No, he's talking about the government of God. The kingdom is the government that heaven belongs to. It's God's system of operation. It's God's playbook, God's way of doing things. Jesus is saying God's kingdom way of operation belongs to people who come to me like these kids do. And then Jesus says something very powerful. Next verse. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child 
will never enter it. <laughs> Is that powerful? If you want to learn how the kingdom of God works, then take a look at how kids approach God and how kids approach His Word. Kids have totally open minds. Kids are moldable. They're not as stubborn as adults are. I got one little... Huh. <laughs> Kids are not as quick to anger as adults are. Kids forgive faster. Kids don't hold grudges like adults do. Kids are quicker to believe and slower to doubt. I'm telling you folks, we adults could learn a thing or two from watching how kids operate in their faith and how they approach God. Kids know how to receive the kingdom. And again, Jesus is not talking about heaven. He's talking about God's government. God's way of operating. Kids know how to receive the kingdom that heaven belongs to. Now let me show you something else that's really powerful. One of the most monumental events in Christian church history was the day of Pentecost. Can we all agree on that? That's basically when the new church was birthed. It wasn't the day that 500 people watched Jesus ascend. It was 10 days later when 120 of them were still left. And they had tarried and they had waited for the Holy Spirit to fill them in the upper room in Jerusalem. Amen? Powerful moment. The Holy Spirit filled everybody there. They began to speak in tongues. That was the birth of the early church. Let me show you something powerful about that day. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Pretty powerful experience. All of these people, they're all Jews, they're all speaking in tongues, but there's Jews in Jerusalem that are from all these different nations and they're hearing their own language being spoken. I had a friend when I was a kid, I still have a friend. <clears throat> I had a friend who was a uh, missionary to Asia and uh, she told me that when she would minister to kids in Asia, when they would get baptized in the Holy Spirit, she would hear kids speaking in tongues, speaking in English. Now the kids didn't know what they were speaking, but she would hear them speaking in English. Uh, I had another friend, um, he lives over in uh, Clewiston, and he's an accountant. But he's not just an accountant, he's, he also considers his accounting business to be a ministry. So people that come to his office for accounting purposes and for taxes and that kind of stuff, he doesn't just do their taxes and do their accounting, he prays with them. And he prophesies over them and he lays hands on them and he, he, he ministers to people, prays over people. Well, uh, he's over in Clewiston and that area in Clewiston, there's a lot of Miccosukee Indians out there because there's a Miccosukee Indian reservation out there. And he said one day there was an older man that came in with his grandson the older man did not speak English, but the grandson spoke English and Miccosukee, so he was, he was being the translator between my friend and this older man. And uh, they were talking about taxes and accounting and all, all that stuff, and then he decided that he needed to pray over this older man. And he said, while I was praying for him, I began to speak in tongues. Well then, when I got done praying, he said, we went back into our conversation, and the old man said something to my friend in Miccosukee, and my friend looked over at the grandson waiting for him to translate, and the grandson just kind of stared at him. And he said, what did your grandfather just say? And he says, what do you mean? I, don't you know? And he says, no, I don't speak Miccosukee. He said, well, you just did. A minute or two ago, you were speaking Miccosukee. 
But he didn't know that. He didn't know what he was speaking. He was just speaking in tongues. So that's exactly what was happening here. People were hearing these people speaking in tongues. They were speaking in their own language. This is the first instance of people speaking in tongues in the Bible. Very powerful moment. Let's read on. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these people who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia. By the way, Phrygia, it's very cold there. I'm just kidding. Fridge, Phrygi, Phrygia. Stay serious, Heath. Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, all of these different people, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Powerful, right? My missionary friend who went to Asia, she said that when she heard the kids speaking in tongues in English, she said they were speaking the praises of God. They were praising the Lord. Powerful. Let's read on. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them. Imagine that. And they said, they've had too much wine. So, a lot of people were witnessing this very powerful event. Some people were amazed at it. Others simply thought that these people are drunk. I want you to think about this for a moment, though. <laughs> Being drunk can cause you to act weird. Being drunk can't cause you to speak in a language you've never spoken before. <laughs> Amen. So they're wondering, what's going on here? So Peter decides to speak up and explain what's happening here. Next verse. Then Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Of course, that doesn't stop some folks. <laughs> no, this is, what's, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Let me ask you, who will prophesy? Say it again a little louder. Sons and daughters. Your kids. Your kids are going to prophesy. And who's going to see visions? Young men. Old men are going to dream dreams, but young men are going, to be, are going to see visions. So if young men are going to see visions, young men are going to be casting vision. Because they're the ones that receive the vision. Young people are the vision casters. Young people are the ones that God is going to use to prophesy. Young people are the ones who are going to be used to lead the church into its future. Now, that's not to say that old people don't have a part to play. Because it does say old men are going to dream dreams. And in a moment, we're going to see another part that older people are supposed to play in this. But Peter is quoting Joel chapter 2 which was a prophecy that was written hundreds of years before Christ came on the scene. God will pour his spirit out on all flesh, on all people. But the first two things that he lists in this passage is that young people will prophesy and young people will see visions. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, but pay close attention to what I'm going to do with the next generation. I'm going to speak through them and I'm going to lead through them. But here's my question. 
How can God speak through them and lead through them if they have not had anyone speaking into them and leading them? That's why the older generation has such a powerful part to play in this. Titus chapter 2, we'll start with verse 1. It says, you, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate. That means sober. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Now, I want to focus on this phrase, self-controlled, because he's talking to older men here. Teach the older men to be self-controlled. There's one thing that I've noticed about older men, especially after they get, if, once they're approaching retirement age or getting past retirement age, older men many times have a tendency to lose self-control. Now, I'm not just talking about bladder control. <laughs> I'm talking about their demeanor. I'm talking about their character, I'm talking about the way they act around other people. We have a phrase, a common phrase that people use in our society. In fact, they made two movies off of this common phrase, grumpy old men. I mean, it's such a common thing that people use that phrase often. They talk about grumpy old men. And I'll tell you what, I, what I've observed. I think a lot of times older men get to a place in their life where they say, I've had my chance to make my money. I've had my chance to build my business. I've had my chance to have a career, to make a difference. Now I'm older. I don't have the energy I used to have. I can't do the things that I used to do. And they begin to feel like they're losing purpose. And it begins to frustrate them. And so they lose their temper easily. They chew out the server in the restaurant. They chew out the cashier at the store. They chew out the customer service person on the phone. They chew out the neighbor kids for walking on their lawn. That's also a common meme that you see all the time. Get off my lawn. My dad called customer service one day. I don't remember what it was for. I don't know if it was the, the phone company or the cable company or whoever it was called the customer service and the person answered customer service can I help you my dad says uh, I need to speak with your supervisor well is there something that I can do for you sir uh, no I, I need to speak to your supervisor well okay well can I tell the supervisor uh, what it is that you need to have addressed no I just need to speak with your supervisor well why do you need to speak with my supervisor because you don't make enough money to hear what I have to say But what happens a lot of times with older people is they realize there's fewer days ahead than there are behind, so they begin to think that maybe they've made all the difference they're going to make. But what should they be thinking? They should be thinking, how can I make a difference in the next generation? How can I pour myself and my wisdom and my knowledge and my experience into the next generation? Let's read on, next verse. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Can I paraphrase this? The older women shouldn't be spending all of their energy trying to find the ultimate frozen yogurt. <laughs> spending all their efforts going to bingo, spending all their time playing mahjong with their other older friends. They should be pouring themselves into the younger generation, teaching young women how to be a, a wife, how to be a mother. Amen? Next verse, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled 
in everything, set them an example by doing what is good. Set an example for young people by doing the right thing. By acting the right way. By exercising patience with people. By using wisdom. Show young people how to be self-controlled by being self-controlled. But how can you be an example to the next generation if you're not spending any time with the next generation? If you're an older man and you spend all of your time with other older men, getting breakfast at the diner a few times a week, telling stories, and we all know that all those stories are exaggerations or flat out lies, <laughs> hanging out of the VFW hall, playing pool, playing golf with your older friends, going to dinner with your older friends. If all you do is hang out with other older people, you are missing out on a God-ordained, God-breathed commandment in His Word. We all have a responsibility to reach the next generation of the church. Folks, there's too much at stake to ignore this responsibility. Because if we don't do it, who's going to? One more scripture and then I'm going to close. Psalm chapter 48, verse 12. Go inspect the city of Jerusalem, walk around and count the many towers. Let me stop here for a second. Jerusalem, in a few different places in the Bible, Jerusalem is referred to as the city whose builder and maker is God. How many have read that before? Okay. Jerusalem is the city whose builder and maker is God. Now, there's also a new Jerusalem, but this is talking about the old Jerusalem. So this verse is telling us, take a close look at the city who, that God built. Take, take a close look at the thing that God did. Take a close look at this city that God built. Walk around it and inspect it. Let's read on. Take note of the fortified walls and tour all the citadels. So, take note of the walls. Inspect this city, this thing that God did, this thing that God built. Count the towers. Tour the citadels. Take a, a close inspection of what God has done. Why? That you may describe them to future generations. It is so important for us to describe to future generations what God has built, what God has done. To explain for future generations what God did in your life. To share with future generations your personal story of how God transformed you and how only God could do it. Folks, kids are open. Kids are hungry. They want to be instructed. They want to be taught. You may not think that they do. They do. Kids want to know that what their boundaries are. Why do you think kids are always pushing boundaries? Because they want to know where the boundary is. They want to, they want to know, okay, what, what is allowed, what's not allowed? And the younger they are, the more they push you. <laughs> But they want somebody to describe to them how life works. But they're never going to be able to carry the torch for Christ if we don't spend time passing the torch, the torch to them. We've got to reach the next generation for the kingdom. Let me ask you, how often do we see in the Old Testament, how often do we see Israel backsliding? I mean, so many times. One generation serves God, the next generation backslides. The next generation serves God again, the next generation backslides. I think Israel backslid like seven times in the first four chapters of Judges. I, I mean, it, Israel's up, down, up, down, up, down, over and over and over again. We find generations backsliding. Why did they backslide? It's because the generation that was serving God the generation that was actually worshiping him and not worshiping idols and not going off the wrong path and not serving the wrong things. The generation that was serving God 
did an inadequate job of passing their values on to the next generation. I think sometimes we get so comfortable in the blessing of our Christian walk that we forget that this blessing isn't just for us. This blessing is for us to pass on. This blessing is for us to pass down. Did you know the phrase future generations is found 10 times in the Old Testament? God keeps telling his people over and over and over again, you've got to pass this on to future generations. So I'm going to close with this. You got some homework. I'm going to send you home with some homework. I want each of us to find someone under the age of 20 and invite them to church. It is so quiet right now. <laughs> if they're a teenager, invite them to one of our fly events. We just had a fly event last night. Fly went and uh, did a laser tag last night. And they got another event coming up in a couple of weeks. If they're a teenager, invite them one of our, to one of our fly events. If they're a preteen, invite them to church on a Saturday night. We got all the kids uh, getting ice cream right now. They, they took all the kids, I think, over to Dairy Queen. <laughs> I, I know. You're all stuck here listening to me. But we've got a good children's ministry, a fun children's ministry. Folks, I've been saying for five years that our church needs to have a growing and thriving children's ministry and youth ministry. We need it. We need it. And at times we've had it, but we haven't been able to maintain it. It's going to be up to us to make that happen. Well, Pastor Heath, why don't you just hire yourself a children's minister and hire a youth minister? You know why? Because the Word of God doesn't say hire a children's minister. It says that the older generation, it's up to us to pour ourselves into the next generation for Christ. Amen? So, bring your kids to church. Bring your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews, your great nieces, your great nephews, your neighbor's kids, your neighbor's grandkids. Bring them to church. We've got a responsibility to reach them for Christ. How can we do that if they're not here? Amen? Find, find a young person to spend some time with and pour yourself into that person. I'm also going to say this. If you're an older man, make sure that it's a young man. Because there's too many older men that are creeping up on young girls. And I'll tell you something else. It will be, it will be received a lot better if you can go with your spouse as a couple. We're going to talk more about this next week because God has really laid some things in my heart to talk about. But in the meantime, your homework is to find a way to connect with some young people and bring some young people with you to church. Amen? Really? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Heath. And I'm Louise. Thanks so much for watching. Please do us a favor and remember to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Also, comment below. Connect with us and let us know if there's anything we can pray about. If you enjoyed this video, we believe you'll enjoy it even more to visit us in person at Faith Life Worship Center in Naples, Florida. You can find Faith Life Worship Center on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or through our website, faithlifenaples.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.